You discussed with friends your approach to punishing Sebastian. A physical, mental and psychological abuse. And no one knew about his miserable life. In it, he described Agnieszka Kalinowska as a brutal tyrant. Friends, this video will make you cry. It'll make you sad. It'll make you angry. You see, 15-year-old Sebastian Kalinowski, he suffered abuse and torture in silence. And he told teachers he was fine when they asked about his safety. During the trial, as a judge ridiculed his mother for caring more about the welfare of her cat than the death of her son, the Polish schoolboy kept quiet about his ordeal at the hands of his mother, Agnieszka Kalinowski, who was 35 at the time. His stepfather, Andre or Andres Latozewski, I don't know how to say his first name, so I'm just going to call him Andrew. He was 38 at the time, and he was a steroid-injecting martial arts fighter. The pair, the mother and the stepfather, got engaged while they were languishing in jail. After being convicted, where both were jailed for life with a minimum term of 39 years for the torture and murder of Sebastian. During the trial, it emerged that the teenager had been subjected to a campaign of horrific and prolonged torture. Being repeatedly abused at their Huddersfield home, he was also abused with an extension cable and they inserted hypodermic needles into him that his stepfather had been using. Why would you insert needles into a teenager, moron? Sebastian was also force-fed and drank and then had to carry out extreme exercise for merely dropping crumbs on his bedroom floor or having gone to the toilet at night. He died in August 2021 after untreated multiple rib fractures which caused sepsis and organ failure. During the trial, the court heard that quiet and shy Sebastian suffered unspeakable horror in silence and did not tell teachers about the abuse he was subjected to at home. Meaning that despite having suspicions, one worried teacher was unable to raise the alarm. Sebastian's English language teacher told the court that she became concerned for his safety months after his stepfather became really aggressive at the school gates, but was not able to raise the alarm because she had nothing concrete to go on. She said, if there had been bruises, I could have reported it, or if Sebastian had said something, I could have reported it. She became concerned after an incident at the school gates at Easter, during which she said Andrew became really aggressive towards her, shouting and waving his hands in front of her. His father was shouting, Sebastian is lazy and a liar, which left the teacher upset and threatened. In that moment, she asked Sebastian, are you okay? And if he felt safe, which he replied that he was fine. However, the court heard that she was left with a real cause for concern over Sebastian after the incident, despite no physical signs, the boy was abused. And his mother was sentenced. The judge, Mrs. Justice Lambert, told her, you just did not care about Sebastian. You are only interested in yourself. The mother, in a letter, wrote to her husband or husband-to-be about her continued love for him and that she told him that she wanted to marry him. The judge said to her, You were only worried about your cat after your arrest. In this very long letter, there was not one word about your son, his death and the loss of his life. The judge's comments came as chilling footage was released by police showing Sebastian before he died. A 22-second video captured on CCTV shows the teen gingerly making his way across his bedroom to sit on a stool. Wearing shorts and a t-shirt, the youngster slowly lowers himself to the seat where he sits hunched over and facing a wall. Jurors were forced to sit through hours of horrifying footage showing Sebastian being abused and tormented. So shocking was the level of violence used against the teenager, the judge took the unusual step of discharging all jurors from future jury service due to the nature of the evidence that they had to sit through. You see, Agnieszka, the mother, previously admitted child cruelty, while Andrew, a steroid-abusing martial artist, admitted manslaughter, but both had denied murder. Sebastian moved to the UK from his native Poland, where he lived with his father in October 2020. 10 months before his death. But life with his mother and stepfather turned into a prolonged and miserable period of suffering. The judge said that between the start of school holidays in July and Sebastian's death in August, there was scarcely a day that went by that Sebastian was not subjected to some form of physical abuse. The judge told the parents Sebastian was a young teenage boy who spoke little if any English. 
had neither friends nor allies in this country and was wholly dependent on both of them for his well-being. Agnieszka sobbed as she was led out of the dock, while Andrew showed little emotion but had his head in his hands for most of the hearing. Most of the trial jurors returned to the court for the sentencing, while sobs could be heard from the public gallery as the judge described some of the abuse, Sebastian's actual father, Jacek, watched proceedings by video link from Poland and in a victim impact statement branded Agnieszka the greatest evil that walks this earth. The court heard that the shy teenager attended secondary school where he was described as a model pupil. Teachers, who said he was pleasant and well-mannered but at times appeared sad, were unaware of the horrors unfolding at home where he was viewed by his parents as a hindrance. Prosecutor Jason Pitter told the jury the abuse became increasingly more severe and violent. He was treated like a gover or lapdog and made to call Andrew Mr. or Sir. Between the abuse, the teenager was forced to humiliating drills such as squats and press-ups. After the couple were arrested in connection with Sebastian's death, police seized CCTV cameras from their house, which prosecutors said had been installed partly to monitor and exert control over Sebastian remotely. In one 30-minute clip played to the jury, Andrew was seen abusing the boy more than 100 times, pausing at one stage to wipe the sweat from his face, while Agnieszka watched TV and ate toast. A quick word on Andrew, have a look at some of those details. He made him do drills, like physical drills, right? He was angry at the boy. He made the boy call him Mr. and Sir. It's clear to me, Andrew had a little man complex. I don't know if he was short, right? I can't really tell from the pictures, but in his brain, he lacked so much confidence. He had no respect from anyone else, so he demanded it from the boy. Wanker. In the weeks before his death, Sebastian suffered repeated violent attacks. In one... The stepfather used a cable on him, with at one stage his mother grabbing him by the neck and on the floor. The prosecutor said punishments were precipitated by things such as Sebastian dropping food on his bedroom floor or having gone to the toilet during the night. Three days before he died, Andrew used his hands and legs and throttled the teenager in a prolonged lasting more than four hours. Sebastian frequently struggled to stand but was picked or held up in order that the assault could continue. On the day before Sebastian's death, Andrew was seen on CCTV forcing food and drink into the boy's mouth and inserting him a number of times with a needle in the groin and thigh. This sick bastard. The prosecution told the trial that Andrew was apparently laughing whilst he did this and that Agnieszka at one point took over inserting Sebastian with the needle. Jurors heard that on the morning of Sebastian's final day, August the 13th, 2021, he went through the routine of being assaulted by both parents. The court heard CCTV showed Andrew taking Sebastian out of the bedroom at 8.25am before carrying him back around 15 minutes later, naked, clearly wet and unconscious. The prosecutor said, Emergency services were called to their house by Agnieszka after Sebastian had been unconscious for around two and a half hours. A court heard Sebastian had suffered multiple injuries, including open wounds to his buttocks and numerous rib fractures, which the prosecution said caused the complications which led to his death. And as I mentioned earlier, the pair got engaged while languishing in jail after being convicted. And to conclude, they were both jailed for life with a minimum term of 39 years for the torture and murder of Sebastian. I mean, look at this poor kid. You know, now that I'm a father, I see, when I see kids in pain, I can see it a bit more. You know what I mean? I can understand it a bit more. This is just disgusting. Agnieszka, the silly cow, did not protect her child. And Andrew, this lowlife, this little man, this imbecile, I hope he gets what he deserves in prison. Now I'm going to move on to another story. Nine-month-old Walter Dean Butler was brought to the emergency room of Columbus Hospital by his mother, Sabrina Butler, at 11.13 in 1989. Everyone who viewed the body of Walter Dean Butler in the early morning of April 12, 1989, remarked that his stomach was noticeably swollen. The swelling was caused by severe internal injuries and bleeding. An autopsy revealed several abrasions, bruises and scars, in addition to the distended abdomen and a prolapsed rectum. 
Some marks, of course, were caused by medical personnel in the effort to resuscitate the child. Internally, the autopsy revealed two areas of rupture or perforation in the small intestine as well as bruising and bleeding. There was a substantial amount of fluid and fecal-like material floating free inside the abdominal cavity, which had entered the cavity through the perforations in the wall of the small intestine. The right adrenal gland, which sits atop the right kidney, was also lacerated. A microscopic examination showed acute inflammation involving the outer surfaces of most all of the organs within the abdominal cavity. This condition is called acute peritonitis and is the body's response to the presence of foreign substances in the abdominal cavity. It is explained at trial that peritonitis generally does not set in until at least an hour after the internal damage is done. As for what caused the internal injuries resulting in death, Dr. Hicks, the pathologist who performed the autopsy, testified that some type of blunt trauma or substantial blunt force to the abdomen had to be the culprit. This opinion was shared by all other medical personnel who testified. No witness accepted the defense's theory that a clumsy attempt at CPR caused such massive injuries. So the question remained, how did this boy suffer this tragedy? Well, Sabrina was questioned by medical personnel and police several times during the early morning hours of April 12, 1989. She gave conflicting versions of what happened. She initially told medical personnel that a babysitter had given the child Benadryl and Tylenol. She stated that Walter had been staying with a babysitter by the name of Esther Hollis, who lived in the same apartment complex. Upon Sabrina's return, Esther Hollis's son came upstairs to the apartment and told her that Walter had stopped breathing. Sabrina claimed to have gone downstairs to the Hollis apartment, couldn't get anyone to answer the door for 15 minutes and finally got someone, later identified as Larry Nance, to drive her and the baby to the hospital. Sabrina stated that she attempted cardiopulmonary resuscitation along the way. A little later, Sabrina told police she left the child with Hollis about 2 p.m. on April 11th, 1989. Sabrina was expecting company that evening, and about 9 p.m., a man named Steve stopped by her apartment. Steve allegedly stayed about 30 minutes, and about 10 p.m., Sabrina went jogging. When she returned, Esther Hollis's son came to her apartment with news that Walter had stopped breathing. Sabrina went to Esther's apartment and attempted to resuscitate the child by blowing in its mouth and pushing on its stomach. She then went door to door for help. A neighbor by the name of Brenda Jackson couldn't help. A girl named Lisa Flowers tried to help and a man named Larry Nance, who lived in apartment number two, drove them to the hospital. Later still, Sabrina gave largely the same story to another officer except to say that she had gone jogging first and that Steve came by at 10.30pm and Esther Hollis's son came to her apartment regarding Walter about 11pm. Officers then proceeded to the apartment complex where Sabrina lived to interview any potential witnesses and to locate Esther Hollis. However, after a thorough check of the other apartments, no person by the name of Esther Hollis was found. In fact, nobody they spoke to had ever heard of Esther Hollis. So Sabrina was interviewed again later at the morgue. She was told that Esther could not be located. Sabrina then recanted parts of her story, claiming that she lied previously out of fear and stating that everything was better now because she was going to be with Walter. Sabrina then gave an amended version of her story, which goes as follows. The baby was with her all day. Then at 10 p.m., she put the baby in a stroller and with the baby in her toe, she went jogging. Sabrina returned to her apartment about 10.20 p.m. and a man named Steve arrived at 10.30. Steve did not stay long and Sabrina put Walter to bed. She checked the baby about 11 p.m. and he appeared normal. She checked him again at 11.30 p.m. and discovered he wasn't breathing. She sought help from her neighbors. Larry agreed to take them to the hospital and en route, Sabrina attempted to resuscitate the child with CPR. Sabrina accepted a request to submit to questioning at police headquarters and arrived there at 3 p.m. on April 12th. There, she gave yet another statement, and once again, her story changed somewhat. This time, admitted that she lied about the babysitter and about receiving a visit from a man named Steve. 
The statement as transcribed and summarized by one of the officers reads as follows. She said, Walter was playing with his toys in the living room at 10 p.m. She fed him some milk. She washed him off around 10 p.m. and put him to bed. She took a shower and ate, then put on her jogging pants and got Walter up and wrapped him up, put him in a stroller and went for a jog. She went up 27th Street North and then 26th Street North for less than a block, then jogged back home pushing Walter in the stroller. She then went back inside and put Walter to bed and went into her room and laid on the floor because her back was hurting. She got up at 11.30pm to use the bathroom and checked on Walter. When she went into his room, he was lying on his stomach and she moved the cover and put his bottle in his mouth and she saw he wasn't breathing. She started pressing on his stomach and blowing in his mouth trying to get him to breathe. She then ran out of her apartment to Brenda Jackson's apartment and asked her to take her to the hospital but she said her kids were in the bed and couldn't take her. She then knocked on another apartment but nobody answered. Then another apartment a girl came out and told her that her baby wasn't breathing. So she grabbed him and took him into Erica's apartment, the girl who opened the door, and laid him on the floor. She was pushing on his chest and blowing in his mouth. She got some people, Larry Nance, to take them to the hospital. He went to the hospital where Dr. Woodard in the emergency room saw Walter. Sabrina talked to a nurse and she had her fill out some papers. Dr. Adams came out and told her that there wasn't anything else they could do. She also claimed that Walter fell out of his stroller sometime around the first of last week and fell over onto the carpet causing some abrasions on his face. Last week of course being then, not now. Then she said other than this, Walter had no other injuries that she was aware of. Now at 7 a.m. Around that same morning, Detective Edward Williams of the Columbus Police Department attended a briefing and was informed of the incident involving Sabrina and Walter. He was directed to go with Donald Freshaw to Sabrina's apartment and to interview potential witnesses. They got no answer when they went to Sabrina's. They were unable to locate anybody named Esther Hollis and left a message with neighbours that they needed to talk with Sabrina. Later that morning, Sabrina voluntarily came to the police department. Williams and Freshaw and Sabrina went into the office. They explained to Sabrina what they wanted to question. She gave a statement which was reduced to writing and approved by her. Once again, her story varied. In this latest statement, Sabrina said that she put Walter to bed at 10 p.m. on the night of April 11th, 1989. After making sure he was asleep, Sabrina left her apartment and went jogging. Upon her return, the baby was awake and crying. Finding a wet diaper, Sabrina began changing it and noticed in the process that Walter's rectum was protruded. She used her finger to push up inside. When the baby would not quit crying, Sabrina took her fist and moved the baby once in the abdomen. She then took him into the kitchen and gave him Tylenol and milk solution to drink. She said he took one swallow and quit breathing. She sought help from her neighbours and got Larry Nance to drive them to the hospital. The baby was dead. Significantly, there was no indication of milk or medicine in the stomach, although a lot of its contents had spilled into the cavity. After giving this statement, Sabrina was arrested and charged with capital murder. She was ultimately convicted and sentenced to death. And none of the facts, as related by the state's witnesses, were contested by Butler, and she rested at trial without offering any witnesses or other evidence. She attempted through cross-examination of the prosecution's witnesses to establish reasonable doubt whether the injuries to Walter could have been caused by her attempt to perform CPR. She also seriously contested the admissibility of her statements to no avail. However, in 1995, Sabrina's case went to retrial. By this time, more evidence emerged about how Sabrina did not murder her son. At the trial, one of Sabrina's neighbours had come forward with evidence that corroborated her account that the injuries to her son occurred during the course of an unsuccessful attempt to administer CPR. I'm not a medical professional, right? But isn't CPR when you close the nose and you poof into the mouth? I know, that's a stupid way to put it, but I'm right, right? How can you administer pain during that? You know what I mean? Like, how can you, how can his abdomens have issues by doing that? I don't get it. In addition, the medical examiner changed his opinion about Walter's death, which he now believed occurred due to kidney malady. And... On December 17th, 1995, Sabrina was acquitted and exonerated. So, to conclude on both stories, Andrew, Agnieszka, I hope those in prison obviously will know what they've done and I hope they dealt with these two accordingly. 
Sebastian, a sweet boy whose life was cut short through no fault of his own. As for Sabrina and Walter, who knows what happened? I'm not an expert. You guys know I'm just a muppet behind the screen. But I do not believe the injuries on Walter were caused by botched CPR. It makes no sense to me. If the professional says, oh, I'm sorry, six years later, it was kidney failure. It's like, come on, bruv. Like, how incompetent is that? I don't know. I don't know how to adjudicate on this second case. So why don't you comment? Tell me what you think.